Thank you. Thank you for having us here. Um, again, my name is Leanne, and I own a private practice in Brea and in Chino, California here. Um, I've been practicing for about 20 years. Uh, let's see, I am a doctoral candidate, so life right now is pretty crazy because I do teach at Chapman University and Fullerton University as well. So I'm not busy enough, so I had to add a doctoral thesis into that as well. Uh, when I was asked to speak by Linda Pippert, uh, she was like, hey, will you do this? And I said, of course I would. I brought it back to my office and I said, this is what I'm going to do. But the girls there said, no, 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 we want to go too. So you kind of have four of us today because I have some of the office staff in, um, in various parts of their career. So it's lovely to see um, where everybody's at. And I'll let them introduce themselves when they come up. And they will tell them a little bit about themselves and what their background is. But uh, I want to thank them personally for making the time today and for helping with the slide presentation in doing that. You have index cards on your chair. Those are for if you have specific questions and you want to write those down, I'm happy to answer those. If you have to run out, write your question down and your email address and I will happily email you any response that I can. I'm happy to do that. Uh, if you have a question during the presentation and it is relevant to what we're talking about, feel free, you know, interrupt because I guarantee you somebody else has that same question. So please um, feel free to speak up anytime you, you need to, you want to. And if we start to veer off a little too much, um, you have all the presentations and I'd rather go with what you need than what I could stand up here and talk about for like an hour and a half. So this is just my disclaimer. Um, I'm here because I want to be here and I want to, you know, get to know a little bit more about this population and see how I can help all of you. Um, so we're looking at social skills. Social skills are used every day. We're looking at that pragmatic language. We're looking at that ability to use nonverbal language in order to make our wants and needs known. We do it every day whether we think about it or not. Our body positioning, our tone, our hands crossed over as we're sitting there, or the way we're sitting in a chair, um, it just conveys a message. And a lot of times individuals will miss that message and they don't truly understand what's being um, said. As we get older, those cues that are not read very well start turning into um, bullying and teasing and that type of an area. And we'll, we'll touch a little bit on that as well and how to address that. So hopefully today we're able to provide you with some really good information and give you some, um, some good tips and tools. So what are we looking at with our social skills? We're using language, changing language, depending upon the situation. We all know what it's like to have that kid come up to you just a little too close. And you're like, whoa, hang on. And I've worked with enough kids in my life where I've had the, the kids who are going through puberty and they do the, <sighs> and I'm like, excuse me, that's my backside. Could you please move your hand? So we've had to get into that type of language and that type of body positioning and social skills. Um, as we use language throughout our years, we're using it first to make our wants and needs known, but as we get older, those wants and needs change. And when puberty hits, that's something completely different. So we always must remember to follow the rules of conversation. Everybody remembers that, keep that arm distance. You know, when you're standing next to somebody, what's happening? What's the communicative intent? Are they staring at their watch? Are they looking at the clock? Are they getting bored? So those little signs and, um, that an individual could be missing. So language, what is our language? We're looking at greetings, informing, demanding, and I hope nobody, nobody knows what demanding is like in this room, do they? Gosh, no. Uh, promising, I know you don't do that, I promise if we can just make it through the store, we will go get you that, stop. Um, and requesting, uh, I want a cookie. Uh, hopefully they do say that I want a cookie please, but I want a cookie is great language. And then we can always flip it to I would like a cookie, because I feel like we overuse want. How many kids say I want this, I want that. And let's flip it into I need this, I see this, I hear this, I would like this. So requesting. And we're going to get into changing language. How do we change language from an individual needs to talk to a, an infant or a baby or a toddler to talking to a professional colleague? How do kids understand what that ability is? Do
Do they understand how to modulate their voice depending upon the speaker next to them? Um, use different language and different verbiage. If I'm speaking to a parent, I'm not going to talk to them the same way that I'm going to talk to a professional colleague and use those words. I want to make sure those parents are truly understanding what I'm saying. Um, knowing to skip some details when somebody already knows the topic. That's a big key. You know, my friend saw the movie too. I'm not going to retell them the whole movie. Um, if my friend likes dinosaurs as well, I'm not going to tell them all about dinosaurs. And I need to know and remember what my friend likes and how I can change that up. And then from classroom to playground, again, modulating that voice. I'm inside. We always hear about our inside voice. Use that inside voice and then I can be louder out on the playground. And why? I think the biggest thing for our kids is why. And I don't understand, and a lot of times they don't get that why. Teachers will look at them and go, inside voice, inside voice, and they don't say, hey, that's too loud for inside. We use our big voice when we're outside, and sometimes providing those little explanations for things can change and help so much. So following the rules, we all love to follow the rules. Um, I know I don't, but that's okay. I cheat a lot when I play games because I always have to make sure that I win sometimes and the kid wins just because not everybody wins. So I will cheat. Um, I don't follow the rules. Um, letting others know the topic when you start talking. So this is key just because we have all done that where our kids come in and they start saying something and you're like, what are you talking about? And you're like, wait, back it up a little bit. And then they say it over again. You're like, oh, you're talking about, the, oh, I got it. So little things like that where those are typical things too. Our kids do it all the time. Um, staying on topic. I think we are all guilty of that in every conversation we've had where we start a conversation and then all of a sudden we flip and they go, weren't we just talking about this? Um, my husband looks at me a lot and says squirrel because I flip all the time. <laughs> And, and I'll do it now, I'll just switch and I'll go, squirrel, <laughs> sorry, that just popped into my head. Um, trying another way of saying something when you mean, when people don't understand, that's a hard skill. There's a lot of speech and language tests will look at um, giving you a phrase and then think of another way to say that. How else could you say that? And that's a hard skill for our kids, trying to turn around and say something once, flip it, and then say it again. In another, um, in another way, to get that message across another way. I think what's great is today we're going to be presenting you information from the um, preschool, elementary, and then we're going to go older kids as well. So you'll get a nice little variety and see how things are hopefully changing for all these kids. Uh, knowing how, to cl um, how close to stand, that one arm's length. Or you can stand a little bit closer when it's your parent. Who are we talking to? I have a, a friend at the office who... Um, she doesn't understand the concept, but when she was born, she was born with a hole in her heart. And her parents came to me and they're like, we're taking blood, do you want to? And I'm like, of course. And I knew her, her parents personally. And I donated uh, blood and they asked me to donate platelets because I was a direct match. So they took blood and platelets from me. And now I see her, she comes into the office for therapy and I always give her a hug and a kiss. And she goes, no, only mommies and daddies. And I always look at her and go, or people who donate their blood platelets to you. <laughs> and, and she just looks at me, because she's 14 now, and she's like, what? And I'm like, and her mom laughs. And now she's gotten to the point where she comes in, and she says, hi, Leanne, I love you. And I go, hi, baby girl. And she gives me hugs. And I don't see her anymore for therapy too much, because we ended up playing a little bit too much and just having way too much fun and being too loud. And I'm like, wait a minute, I need to step back. I'm going to step back and not be her therapist, and I'm going to let somebody do the real work, and I'm just going to play with her. Um, so facial expressions and eye contact are also areas that we're going to be talking about today. Facial expressions and eye contact are huge. Um, we all look at individuals around us in everything that we're doing. And isn't it interesting when you're sitting there and you're going, you're looking at your phone and you're trying to give somebody those subtle cues that you really got to go and they're just not picking up on it. And you're just going, I'm looking at my phone. I, I'm looking at my watch, I'm shaking my keys, I'm looking for my keys, I'm, I'm doing something to try to let them know that I really need to leave, and they're just not getting that information. Um, eye contact, I personally don't push eye contact at first. I know in schools they'll write an eye contact goal, and I, I know for some people it's uncomfortable, especially our autism population. They do not like to make eye contact. 
So when they get older and they get to that ability where they understand what eye contact is for, what does that mean? Well, that lets me know that you're thinking about me and you're letting me know that you're still listening. So I'll teach them a social peek. Go just peek at me, everyone. You can look over here, but just give me a little, that's all I want. Just look at me, just peek over. And so I know you're still thinking about me and you're not thinking about Legos, which they probably are anyway while I'm talking, but that's okay, because they did that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. So um, who needs social skills intervention? 95% uh, of the world does. <laughs> I mean, socially, we're all pretty awkward now. We all stare at our phones way too much. We all have poor posture because of that. Um, but honestly, we all need a little help and we all need a little reminders. But for our kids with autism, they have difficulty maintaining interactions and engaging with others and keeping that interaction going. They, our autism population knows the rules and they're gonna be the first one to tell you the rule, but they're just not gonna follow the rule. And that happens often. Uh, I remember one kiddo that I went into the school and I watched him sitting down at his table. A kiddo got up, he got up out of his chair, went over to her and said, you're not allowed to get up. <laughs> I was like, what'd you just do? Um, so little things, those rules that they know the rules and typically when you're having an assessment done, you do some of those testing, you do that, you look, do they know the rules? Well, if they know the rules, you're gonna go out to the playground and you're gonna say, do they follow the rules? That's a difference. There's a difference between knowing the rules and following the rules. And a lot of our kids know the rules, but they just don't do them. Um, so looking at individual TBI, you're looking at executive functioning, you're looking at problem solving, self-awareness. Uh, and then definitely for your population here, they have difficulty with facial recognition. This is where we don't want to use um, like cartoon photos. Cartoon photos are hard to understand, they're hard to bridge upon, they're hard to make that connection to a real face. You want to get photos. And more photos you get of real people, photos of different people, uh, photos with girls with short hair versus long hair. That's a big thing because a lot of times kids are so used to girls having long hair they see a girl with a, a short hair and they think it's a boy. Um, so little things like that. Um, transferring information across that in, um, the hemispheres and then impulse control. They're very impulsive. So we have to really kind of rein that in a little bit. So getting into preschool, and we're going to have Ms. Alexa come up and talk about this. Um, Alexa, come on up. She's very nervous. Oh. <laughs> Hi, good morning. My name is Alexa. I am a Cal State Fullerton graduate. I'm currently waiting for my SLIPA license, and I had the wonderful privilege to not only intern at Jump and Shop Therapy, but also have um, an opportunity to soon be a speech therapist. And I also got to be mentored by these wonderful speech pathologists, especially Leanne, incredible. Um, so I'll just go ahead and jump into this slide. So social skills are typically um, introduced to preschool age children, where the individuals learn to play and interact with one another. Some of the skills that they are learning, which include play skills, very important, imaginative um, play, where they're learning to come up with different ideas, how to interact and make a world that is different from their everyday lifestyle. That also includes sharing toys, taking turns, um, which falls into turn taking. A lot of children at the two and three age, uh, two and three year old stage are at the me, me, me stage. So learning how to take turns and say, it's my turn, okay, now it's your turn, is very important because that will lead up to future um, exchanges as they get older. Um, another great one is basic conversation. Now, conversation does get tricky as we get older. Um, when they're children, it's two to three exchanges at most. Are you using that toy? Can I play after? Hi, what's your name? That's the beginning stages of what later will become grander conversations that they will express ideas, wants, and needs. And conflict resolution. Instead of throwing tantrums and you know, crying on the floor or pushing one another, they're going to learn how to go to an adult and ask for resolutions that they can later use in life, which is very important. Not everyone has the same opinion or ideas, so they need that in future play. Um, our next speaker is Miss Alicia, so I'll let her come up and talk. 
Hi everyone, um, I'm Alicia Magdaleno. I'm a graduate from Cal State LA. I am a SLIPA at Jump and Shout Therapy, wonderful company. Um, and <laughs> um, I, these ladies are my mentors as well and I'm so grateful for them. Um, I'll go ahead and jump into social skills learned in elementary school. First, we're gonna talk about um, conversational turn-taking. As Alexa talked about, it's very basic when they're in preschool, it's just a couple exchanges. As we go into elementary school, children are more wanting to engage in conversation. So they're initiating conversation, asking questions, giving follow-up comments, and really these exchanges grow from those two to three exchanges to six plus exchanges depending on the topic. So that, that skill is important and it builds upon as they get older to junior high and high school. Um, we're going to look at the next one, making friends. So um, this becomes an important skill that we learn in elementary school as well. Um, children have a stronger desire to make friends, to share toys, to want to play with their peers' toys as well. Um, Turn-taking in a game becomes important and um, for them to initiate those, those turn-taking um, activities as well. Uh, Play-based activities with others, they become a lot more interested in wanting to engage socially with their peers at this age. Um, next we're going to look at perspective taking. Um, being able to understand that the way they feel about achieving a specific goal is not always the way their peer might want to achieve that goal. So, um, or if you look at how this child is looking, their favorite character, their favorite toys, is not going to be this peer's favorite character or favorite toys, and that's okay. We all have our opinions about what we like and what we don't like, and we have to learn to work with others um, that have different interests than us. Um, and understanding that their peer might want to contribute to a conversation or their peer might want to take a turn at a game or have a chance to win. So being able to understand it's not me, me, me anymore, that we have other peers that want to join with us and play with us. Um, we're going to look at topic maintenance for a longer length of time. So just like we look at conversational turn taking, we're going to look at being able to talk about a certain topic for an amount of time. Topic shifts might not always be smooth or good transitions, but children are able to recover, and once a new topic arises, they're able to kind of continue that conversation for a longer period of time and be able to stay on topic for quite some time. Um, the last one we have is body language and emotions. Now this is really important because it's kind of a nonverbal thing that kids learn to do, and it's like those subtle cues uh, Leanne was talking about earlier. Um, being able to understand proximity. So um, am I too close to my uh, peer where I'm making them feel uncomfortable? Or am I not close enough where my listener might not know I'm speaking to them? Do I need to get closer? So understanding that proximity is important. And also body language that is showing um, emotions. So being able to read facial cues if our peer is maybe feeling sad, uh, you know, we can ask what's wrong, what's going on, do you feel left out, things like that, being able to include them. Or if we are making them laugh, we can identify, oh, I'm saying something funny, I'm doing something funny, um, and I can continue to make the other person happy. So being able to read those body language cues are um, very important for us to react appropriately to them. Um, next, we're going to talk about social skills learned in junior high and high school, and Allison will go ahead and take us there. Hi, my name's Allison Path. I'm a clinical fellow at Jump and Shout Therapy. And what that means is I'm in the last practical experience that I have as part of my master's program before I become a fully licensed speech language pathologist. I completed post-baccalaureate work and my master's degree at Cal State Fullerton. And I'm very fortunate to be here. I love all of the people that I get to work with. So getting into a discussion about junior high and high school, we now have a shift in focus from familial relations to uh, social groups apart from the family. Now we're going to start developing more adult-like skills. This can include topics like dating, career aspirations, bullying, and other things that we would address in a more adult-like fashion. And that's gonna involve a lot of perspective taking. So they're going to need to understand more about the logic and reasoning behind things, and they start to develop a understanding of cause and effect. How if I say, I don't like your hair to my friend, they're going to become upset, and they may not want to speak to you after that. Uh, something else that's gonna happen is now we have less of a one-to-one -one ratio of, now it's my turn to talk, then it'll be your turn. We have 
conversations that can last anywhere from minutes to hours, depending on the topic. And within that, there may be various shifts in conversational topics, but the way that they handle those topics will be more adult-like. They're not going to just jump from, we're talking about the weekend, to now we're going to talk about movies. There might be a tie within that. So for example, if a friend mentioned, oh, I saw the new Incredibles movie over the weekend, they might then start talking about movies they've seen recently because that is similar enough in topic. Conversational turn-taking also shifts to now focus on um, more of an overall contribution. So instead of a one-to-one -one ratio again, we might have someone that contributes more information for a period of time and then they allow someone else to contribute as well. Body language becomes extremely important in this age group because just like we mentioned before, you've got a lot of concerns about proximity and where you can stand to make someone either aware that you're speaking to them or if you're standing too close, make them uncomfortable. <laughs> but uh, certainly, you would be able to assess what is going on in a conversation very readily. For example, if you have someone that is beginning to lose their audience, they might notice that someone's putting their hand on their cheek, they're drifting off, and then they would need to make a quick adjustment and possibly change topics or find a way to grab their audience's attention again. <laughs> yes. um, it, it, likewise, understanding emotions will come into that as well. A lot of our emotions are conveyed non-verbally, so they have to be able to assess the non-verbal cues within the context of emotions. They'll also go from using words like sad and mad to more adult-like terms like devastated and frustrated to convey a wider range of emotions, not just for themselves but also for other people. Finally, uh, they'll begin to use different registers depending on their listener. A register is just the way that we're speaking to somebody based on who that person is. So the way that they're going to talk with their peers will be different than the way that they talk with their parents, and that would be different than the way they talk with their teachers, which is, uh, as they get older, going to differ from how they communicate with their employer. This is going to become extremely important as they get older because as they're beginning to transition even into college age, they're going to be interacting with so many different social groups that they'll have to learn how to navigate each one independently. We're going to shift focus a little bit to talk about the skills that we target and the ways that we can do intervention to target those skills. So this slide just kind of mentions some of the verbal social skills that we've discussed already. So we have topic maintenance, turn taking, perspective taking, and conflict resolution, solving problems as they come up in conversation that we've discussed throughout the age range, but now we've added in clarification. So if something becomes unclear in a conversation, we have to either ask a question, rephrase the information, or in some way make information clearer for our listeners. As we're targeting these social skills, there's a wide variety of interventions that can be used. Really the takeaway from this slide is there isn't one correct way to handle social skill intervention. As therapists, we're going to use a lot of different methodologies all combined. So, for example, depending on the skill I'm targeting, I may do role playing, social stories, have a child in a social group, and then have direct instruction as well. Um, we'll talk more in depth about each type of intervention, but just knowing that every client, every child is going to respond differently to various interventions is going to be really important to take away here. The first type of intervention that I'll be discussing is direct instruction. This is exactly what it sounds like. Direct instruction is explicitly teaching a skill uh, in a scripted way so that it's very clear what the rules are for that situation. For example, if you're working on conversational turn taking, uh, a therapist could write up a handout that says, conversational turn taking is when I let my friends say something right after I've said something too and everybody has to contribute something to the conversation so that we have a clear understanding of what's going on and then you might break it down into this is why you need to do this this is how you can do this and then here are some examples for you to practice so it's going to be very explicit in how we interact with our peers, adults, anyone. And a big part of this is going to be training people who work with children who have social skill issues to use this type of rule as well. So parent training and peer training becomes a big part of this type of intervention. 
for these skills, we might send handouts home, or if it's in a classroom, we could pull a friend aside and say, this would be something we can work on with Johnny. Let's practice conversation together, and here's th some things that I want you to be able to do, too. Um, it, since it is really heavily rule-based, it does take more practice to apply to different scenarios. For example, you might have a child who's really good at taking turns when they're doing greetings. They know the script to the T, and they can say, hi, how are you? I'm good. What did you do this weekend? And go through those questions perfectly and allow someone to respond to them. But then you go on to talk about a topic like uh, vacations, and they cannot keep the conversation going. They monopolize it, or they just don't respond at all. And that would be an issue because they, they don't know how to apply the rule to that situation yet. So in those kinds of instances where we have a problem like that, we're gonna use a lot of practice to help that skill, what we call generalize. That just means you know, taking a skill and using it in other situations or in other settings with different people. One thing that's great about this type of intervention is it is really engaging and it does help uh, clients improve their social skills more so than just practicing a social skill on their own. The reason this is so helpful is it gives reasons why something is important to do. They don't know why they need to uh, allow someone to contribute to a conversation or why they need to try to take someone else's perspective just innately. And I don't think any of us do. It helps to have those rules so we know what we're doing and have the reasoning behind it. Another thing that's really good to take away from this is this can be done with children who have complex communication needs. What's, what that means is they might not be able to communicate verbally very readily. So in some instances, you can use an iPad or have a piece of paper that has pictures on it to help people communicate. Um, in some studies, they've shown that you can increase conversational turns, overall engagement in a conversation, and join attention with this type of instruction for any type of communication that we're addressing. The next thing that we'll discuss is video modeling. Video modeling is a really great resource for showing how a scenario can be acted out. This video can contain adult models, um, it can contain peer models, and it can also be the child themselves. So if you're at home with your child and they're you know, interrupting in the conversation or they're not paying attention and they keep turning their body away, you can actually videotape the conversation on your phone, iPad, whatever you feel comfortable using, and then watch it back together. Um, these can be used to talk about the ways that we're handling a situation in an expected way and an unexpected way. We're trying to see if they're doing what they should be doing in a conversation or if they're, you know, doing something completely different. Uh, this can be a part of direct instruction in that you can use it to talk about the rules and then you can also look at how the skill is maintained over a long period of time and how it applies to different settings. This picture on the slide is actually from a social skill video that I've used pretty frequently in therapy. It has two children that are talking and one of them keeps interrupting and talking about what he wants to talk about, which is his own dog. And the thing that's great about this video in particular is it shows the way that they shouldn't handle the situation and the way that they should handle the situation. So they have both options and then they show the thought process behind it. So each of the little, uh, boxes within the video here show what the person's thinking in real time, which is really helpful. There's also a, um, a book called Movie Time. <laughs> Movie Time, and it has like a little popcorn box on the cover of it, and I'm blanking on who the author is, but that also goes through multiple steps, depending upon where the child is developing and what type of a listener and participant they are, and it gives you the guidance, it gives you the scripts. So it tells you, pull out this clip from this movie, this is how you're gonna discuss it. Um, I'll try and find who the author is, but I know it's called Movie Time, and it's for social skills. You can find it on Michelle Garcia Winner's um, website as well. I believe she puts it up there. But it's fantastic because it gives you the level. So depending upon where your child is functioning, you're able to take it from that beginner to more of an intermediate to that advanced social listener, uh, communicator, and work through the um, the movie time script. Make sure it's not too loud. Yeah, hopefully the volume won't be too loud. We have a little bit of the clip for this particular video here. Tower. 
have a conversation, not only do you have to get someone's attention, but you also have to take turns speaking yeah. and listening. Let's see what happens in a conversation between Sam and John. Hey, Jonathan, I got a puppy yesterday. His name is Matt. He's getting a clothing Oh, I have a dog too. His name is Cecil. And he's digging for rocks and stuff. Yeah, and you know Cecil? Yeah, he goes up to my bed to go to sleep. Yeah, and he's all oh, right. Oh, my dog's really cool because he's like taking for rocks and eating everything. <laughs> Let's see what everyone's thinking. Keeps interrupting me. Why don't let me tell him about my dog? I want to tell Sam all about my dog. <laughs> don't give me a chance to talk. People will only want to talk to you if you stop and listen to what they have to say, too. If you don't, the friend will probably get frustrated and walk away. Let's see what Jonathan could have done differently to get a better outcome. <laughs> hey, Jonathan, I got a dog yesterday. His name is Max, and he's dead at 482. Oh, I have a dog, too. His name is Cecil. Yeah, that's cool. My dog, he do like tricks and take him outside and play with him. I really want to tell Sam about my dog, but he really wants to tell me about his dog. We should probably take turns. Yeah, I taught him up and lay down. I taught him sit and lay down, and I taught him how to roll over and fetch. Oh, you taught him a lot. Maybe our dog should meet up sometime. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> So you can see there are a lot of different ways that this can be approached too. This isn't the only skill that can be targeted with this type of a video. You can absolutely use this for body language. You can use this for providing information that's relevant to a conversation. Um, and there are definitely several pre-made videos out there that are easy to access. And books like Movie Time can really be uh, helpful in knowing exactly how to break it down. Modeling is the exact same thing as video modeling, but without the use of a video. You can do this in a bunch of different settings just at home. Um, say that your child's having difficulty uh, paying attention to the conversation during dinner. You can model a conversation with a sibling, your spouse, a friend, anybody who is there, and then have them practice that skill right after. Um, it's really helpful for practicing targeted skills in a bunch of different settings. Now we're going to have Alicia come back up to discuss some other intervention types. Okay, so the next one we're gonna talk about is role playing. This, this intervention method is by far my favorite intervention method because it can be used in a variety of settings and it can be used for all levels of ch with children. Um, when we talk about role playing, there's two different types. We have <laughs> scripted and unscripted. Now scripted is going to be um, much more explicit in the way that we're handling situations. So it's going to be how, um, how do we make a friend? So what's a, a scenario in which we're learning how to make friends and what are we going to say? What should our responses be? And you as the parent or as a clinician, you can kind of role play that out. You can act it out with the child and have them have specific responses to respond back with you. Um, what I, I tend to prefer unscripted uh, role playing just because you can use it in, um, you can kind of generalize it a lot easier. So if we look at unscripted, we're going to look at, in this example, there's a scenario in each of these. You can choose one, and you as the parent or clinician can start to figure out um, how to be the best way to respond. So if, if you're feeling bullied, um, if the child's feeling bullied, what are some responses that you would say? You know, I don't like when, when you say those things, they, they are unkind, and you can kind of role play and you can go through what's the best way to handle it, what might we want to try that's better, um, and you can practice things like body orientation. Um, if, we're not, if we want to work on eye gaze, you know, you might be looking off too much so the, the person that you're talking to doesn't know you're speaking with them. There's just a variety of ways that you can handle um, or you can work with social skills targeted and role playing. Um, what's great about it too is you can do it as, at home. So if you guys are practicing going out to dinner or going to a social event, you can use it at the dinner table. So you can talk about what's appropriate to bring up for a dinner conversation. Uh, what are some things we can say and you and your child can role play that. Um, doing laundry. If you are having your child help you with laundry and they're taking their um, clothes to their, their sibling, what are they going to say when they hand over their clothes to their sibling? Um, there's just a lot you can work with in role playing and it's just generalizing that direct instruction, what you're taught 
how to have a conversation, you apply that and you act it out. So I like this method a lot. It helps to um, generalize things and kind of act it out together. Um, let's see. The next one, we're gonna talk about social stories. Um, social stories are helpful for children with ASD. Understand rules of social communication and how to appropriately react to um, any given situation. They typically will include personally relevant examples to help the child apply it to their own lives. So for example, um, I have a kiddo that when he feels frustrated or angry, he tends to hit things. He'll hit the table or um, hit the objects that I have laid out on the table. So we have a social story for him that when I'm feeling upset or I feel that anger's coming on, I can stand up, take 10 deep breaths, go for a walk around the room, and then I can come back and sit down. So we have pictures that kind of go with that, and we talk about what is it that we can do in a situation that we're feeling this. So um, social stories are very helpful to reinforce the skills that we're teaching in direct instruction. What I also love about social st stories, excuse me, is you use them in the moment. If your child is frustrated, let's write a story about this. And you start them, and you start having them describe their feelings. I'm frustrated. Why are you frustrated? Let's write that down. What's happening? You know, I had a kiddo who came in, not even on the spectrum or anything like that, very frustrated. She um, really wanted to have a specific movie that day, and she couldn't find the video. And it was just, and mom comes in and she's like, I can't get her off of it, she's stuck on it, she's so upset, and we talked about it, and I go, what's going on? I'm frustrated, why are you frustrated? I can't find my video. Okay, what are we gonna do? We talked through it, we problem solved together, and she still had another therapy to go to after me. So we wrote this story about that, that it's okay that I can't find the video, I can look for it in another place when I get home, I can try to do this, I can try to remember, um, to look over here. We just kind of worked through it, we problem solved. And what was great about it is by the time she got to the end of it, she looked at me and she goes, oh, this isn't a big deal. I'm like, no, it's not, it's not a big deal. I'm like, You're, oh, we're gonna, t and we talked about it again. And then when the next therapist came in, because we have um, occupational and physical therapy along with speech within our facility, she grabbed the story, printed it out, gave it to Renee, who's the occupational therapist, and said, I can't find my video. And I was like, read the paper. And she was like, oh, you wrote a story about it. Let's do the story. So then they carried through the story into OT and was able to completely read it one time and then have a great successful um, session. And it was done and it was over with. And then when she got back to her mom, you know, that was probably another story because it was mom. But mom had this story and was able to read through it a few more times. Mom ended up making a binder of all these stories because this little one had um, anxiety. And it was anxiety about going here. We have to go here. I don't want to do this. Okay, well, let's talk about it. I have to go to the dentist. I feel this at the dentist. Why don't we like the dentist? I don't like when the dentist does this, this, and this. What could you do? I'm going to ask the dentist to tell me what he does before he does it. I'm going to ask the dentist to do this. And then she took that story, read it a couple times, brought it to the dentist. The dentist read it and was like, okay, if that's what you need to make you like, happier and more successful in the chair, we're going to do that. And so the dentist joined in also on the social story and was able to have a great dental visit. So we can use these for our, um, all different types of situations and scenarios, but it really helps our individuals um, kind of just process their thoughts. Yeah. Um, he wanted to know if there's pre-made stories or if it should always be written by the child. Uh, I think when you're in the moment, I think it's always great to include the child if you can get the child to calm and to verbally tell you what's going on. Even if you have non a nonverbal child, they can let you know what their nonverbal are actions, what's happening. When I don't like this, I get up, I throw, th oh, I'm going to put this down. You're upset because I see you throwing that thing over there. So I throw my shoe across the room. You know, what should I do? I should do this. And you can have them kind of interact with you. Carol Gray has a great resource, um, My Social Stories, I believe that's what it is. Um, and so there are pre-made stories that are um, out there for you to use, but I think individualizing them, 
are, um, it's just, it's more meaningful. But you can use them that are pre-made. I think we have a slide later on where we have a big old re bunch of references on there for you guys and we'll touch on it there. And if we don't, I'll make sure to make a note of it. I saw another hand over here. Nope. Okay. Okay, we'll go, definitely go through a bunch of resources for you towards the end. Just in, we can go through them and explain them. Go for it. Okay, so we're gonna move on to comic strip conversations. Now these are very similar to the social story aspect, but there's a lot more visuals and drawings involved. So it can be, um, you can have written words, visuals, drawings, and it kind of systematically goes through what someone might be saying, doing, or even thinking. So when we look at the comic strips, we can um, kind of create multiple bubbles around the, the people that are speaking. So we might be having a bubble talking about what's being thought about and also what's being said. These types of uh, comic strip conversations help with the quick exchange of information um, during a social situation. It might be difficult for some kiddos. Um, and you can apply it the same way Leanne was talking about for the dentist visit or for um, when you're feeling frustrated or angry. And this one you can definitely personalize for kiddos um, when you want to use an example. There, you can just do simple pictures with bubbles or you can get you know, pre-printed ones and fill in the bubbles as you go. So they can be applied to many situations. Um, and they're, they're once again uh, personally relevant examples for the kids so they can identify a lot better um, with them. Um, let's see. So, let's see, I think the next one we're gonna go into is, oops, social scripting and computer conversations with Alexa. So much like the social stories and the comic strips, social scripting and computer conversations are very much alike. Now, not all parents have the time to break down step by step with their child and write down exactly A, B, and C is going to take place and this is how you'll respond. Some kiddos do work better visually, but some need that physical example as well. So much like the video Allison displayed for us about the two children interacting about what originally happened and what should happen, computer conversations um, also can give that child that example. Um, we use it early on in intervention, and it helps the child learn on how to act during certain social, social situations. And it also gives them ideas on how to give them scripts and how to greet one another. Now, just like ASD children, a lot of them can use social scriptings like good morning, how are you? But again, they don't always know how to use it in a variety of settings. So we put that into practice through practicing conversations in the treatment room, but also at home. It's not only limited at speech therapy. When you're with your child, you can interact with them when cooking. You can say, how was your day going? Oh, it was good. Oh, I had a bad day. So why was it a bad day? And it gives them a variety of having conversations in different settings other than the playground or at school with kids, but with also adults. Um, social skills groups are a great and positive way to have children practice their skills, not only with children that are their age, but with different developmental stages. Um, children who interact with typical developing peers, while those peers act as a knowingly um, model and motivate children to demonstrate and imitate those behaviors, which otherwise wouldn't have been acted upon if they had not seen it. Um, results of research are generally positive, but that also has to happen if they go to therapy where they're given direct in instructions and given back feedback saying, okay, so-and-so, this is what you responded to this situation, but instead of responding it and using this type of tone, let's try it another way, and that way they will get better communication, not only amongst their peers their age, but also adults and younger children, because they're not only going to interact with those who are around their age and um, mental development, but also in different stages of life. And individual visual schedules are a lot alike of what we had talked about earlier, except it gives a breakdown of how a child can cope with different frustrating moments. 
Um, you're, as a parent, you're not always with your child 24-7, and neither is their caretaker. When they do come to therapy, sometimes we have kids who do get frustrated, and it's hard for them to convey why they're frustrated, and we don't know your children like your parents do. So it's okay to come and talk to your therapist when you know, okay, they get more anxious or frustrated in this type of setting. Do you think we can come up with a schedule that will take it step by step on how they can cope with this type of situation? Much like this example above, um, this child has difficulties expressing themselves verbally, so they have to take five deep breaths. They can move away from the problem draw a picture of who they need to talk to or what they need and try and talk to an adult or a caretaker about what would make them more comfortable. We often do that with children in our therapy rooms when they get anxious. Maybe they just want their toy from home and mom and dad have it in the car. We can bring that into session and we have done that before and we can carry out the session getting as much progress as we need done and it turns out awesome. What's great about these visual schedules is that they're easy to put away either in their backpack, binders, cubbies, or even just put it in their pocket. They can take it out, they look at it, and they realize, okay, I can step back, I know how to calm down, I won't always have mom and dad, but I can do this on my own. Children want to be self-advocates because that's what they're aiming for as they get into adulthood. And we will talk about that later. And giving them already this idea in the back of their head, as they mature, they will know, I don't need this anymore. I know how to calm myself down. And when I was a child, I was always nervous and anxious. Going to the dentist, I would be nervous about. My mom would have to tell me, OK, this is what we're going to do. This is what will happen. And I felt a little bit at ease. So by the next time I went again, I already had an idea of what would happen. And I wasn't as nervous. And children who are high functioning typically do get a lot of anxiety because they don't like change and they don't like to leave their parents' side, which is understandable. So we're just trying to give them tools and parents so they know how to be okay when they're away from home so they can be um, well-functioning adults in later years. And I will give nonverbal skills to Leanne. All right, nonverbal. I know a lot of parents out there who have kids who are nonverbal. And with our nonverbal kids, we don't get to practice all those social skills, that social scripting, all that. That might not come into play. So what do we do with our kids who are nonverbal? What are we going to look for? Uh, I had a kiddo who um, I did an assessment with Renee, and Renee is the occupational therapist. She's fantastic. But there we were with this nonverbal child, and everyone is telling me that she uses her pecs, and she is able to do a sentence strip for so long, and she points to her sentence and she's peck stage four and she's great. Well, when I saw her, she was really peck stage one because <laughs> she didn't use a book consistently and she didn't carry her big binder with her everywhere that she went. But what I saw and what Renee and I saw was just the most amazing communicative intent. Uh, there were four adults in that room along with all these kids and we watched from the sidelines as she went over to another kid, sat next to her and went, and I was going, oh God, look at that, right there. What is she doing? She's like, hey, look at me. Talk to me, do something with me. And she had a ball in her hand and she was like, I'm right here. And somebody just needed to be right there to facilitate that and to help her, look, look, what is she doing? She sat next to you. She's smiling at you. What could she be asking you? So they need that someone to help facilitate what they could be asking. Another great thing and what was heartbreaking was when an adult would walk by, she would look at them and go, and then she would go back to her, and then, but nobody looked at her because there was no voice, but she was communicating so much, and she found Renee and I, and she goes, and we went, <laughs> and she was like, like someone saw me, I'm not invisible, and that's what she needed. And she was just this verbal ability, this nonverbal ability that she had was, she could tell a story with her eyes. And until somebody was right there helping to facilitate that and say, you know, she, I went up to the teacher and I'm like, she's trying to talk to you guys. She's talking with her body and her eyes and she's letting you know what she's thinking and feeling. She'll look at you and she'll nod and she's understanding the story. She gets into this. If something bad happens, you saw it on her face. She didn't like that very much. 
they were asking, the teacher was asking a question about the dinosaur and it was about the tail and she stood up and was like this, letting you know that the dinosaur was swishing his tail. So all of this nonverbal gestural communication was there, but somebody wasn't there to facilitate the interaction and that's what was missing. And that's where you as parents really have to advocate and give that, help give that child a voice. Whether they're using the device, I see what you're doing, tell me what you're doing. Maybe they have a device where they're supposed to then say, you know, the dinosaur used his tail or his tail or come play with me or they use a comic strip or they are able to use those conversations then to engage in a child and to facilitate that language after all and say, hey, can you come play with me? I have this ball with me. Um, so we've talked about that. So intervention for nonverbal communication. So you have that direct instruction, as I just mentioned. You're teaching children about body position and facial expression, letting them know what that facial expression is going to get them. If you're doing this with somebody, they're going to see that. If you're, you have that sad face, I can see that sad face. I can see you don't like the story. I can see that you don't like what we're doing. How are you going to tell me to change it? How can we change it up and make it different? Um, video, video modeling is key. As I said, I'm not a big fan of um, like cartoon drawings, just because I think it's sometimes hard for kids to read the facial expression. It's not a real person. And you guys are their best model. Go out there, get their friends. Take pictures of, of um, family members and friends that they know. Take in a uh, video of interactions on the playground. Uh, see what you can do with just friends and family. And then you're going to sit down and you're going to explain it. And you're going to say what happened in the situation. What is this body? What is this friend saying? What are they doing? So they have that nonverbal communication and they're able to um, get that their message across as well. Um, you're going to model things. So you're showing it in the video, but then you're going to say, okay, can you show me? Show me how she looks angry and see about their angry face. And then show me how, show me how they look bored. Um, when you're in the moment. That is the best teaching moment at all because they, you're in the moment, the kid's looking at you like this, and you're like, I can see you're not happy. I mean, I get this face a lot because I have a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old, but, you know, that's different. Um, so pulling up those faces and those in-the-moment types of activities where you see them interact with a friend, and you're going to stop them, you know, and see what you can do. Sir. Yeah, and that's a great point. He was talking about how um, our message that when we talk to these kids, how it gets misread so many times. Um, and that's a great way to put in some of those video modeling and those scriptings because you can show a script. What happens at this tone? What happens at this tone? You know, how do you know when you're in the moment, if you look at somebody and you say, go find your shoes, um, mommy's getting a little upset. So you need to make sure that you're conveying that proper message to where it's not being read. Or if you, are you being um, a little funny? You know, so those, and I think when you start to get a little um, ambiguous, that's when it gets harder, and that's when our kiddos get picked on more. Because they can't understand. They're not reading those tones correctly. And you're getting some kid who's telling them to go do something. And they're thinking that they're being serious and not understanding the message underneath that is, is not appropriate or it's, it's um, not right and it can be rude. So those are things that we have to be able to teach our children so they can advocate for themselves. Role playing is a big part of this. If some kid comes up to you and tells you to go take that off of that desk, you're not going to go do that. Even though they think they're being funny and they're smiling about it, and they're saying, hey, 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 go get that. Yeah, you think they're being your friend, so we have to be able to teach them that mean um, teasing versus, you know, that spirited kind of interaction. Preschool. So we have here different scenarios that will give an example of how we might see a child come in and how, what different types of goals that we will use in order to alleviate and make it a little bit better. So it says here John is a three-year-old boy diagnosed with mild to moderate ASD. Um, he doesn't acknowledge his family or people around him or play much with his siblings. So 
turn taking and toy sharing is not something this little fellow is about. Um, but we do have examples of three different goals that we would possibly give to the child. One of them is playing with others and engaging in appropriate and cooperative social play interaction. So what we might do in therapy here is have a child pair up with another one of our peers. Let's see how they play alongside each other. Um, a great example is playing with a ball. Instead of grabbing the ball and throwing it at the other kid, why not learn how to pass it to the child? We don't need to be aggressive, but learn how to be um, using toys appropriately. And that gives the child the ability to know how to interact, not with just that age, but older age groups. Um, another great one that a lot of our ASD have trouble with is greeting, saying hello, goodbye. A lot of the times when we take them from mom and dad, we say, okay, say goodbye to mom, and then we bring the mom back. When they come and see our therapist, we say, oh, say hello to Miss Allison, or can you say hi to Miss Alicia? Do you, they don't know their name. You can say, oh, well, why don't we ask them, what's your name? Teaching them simple little steps on how to introduce themselves and greet others, not only just in the therapy room, but we can also translate that to back at home. So when you have your child at home, let's say you're taking goods to your neighbor, bring your child with you. Let's go take this to our neighbor. Why don't you say hello? We hope you're doing well. How's your day going? Give them cookies. Or with just their siblings, how was school today? Do you want to play with me? Any little simple task like that gives that child not only the confidence to be able to speak with one another, but also confident in themselves, in which we do want that. If Whether it's a typical developing child or one who's on the spectrum, we want everyone to feel confident and secure in themselves, that they know what they want, they know what they're saying, and they're not afraid to approach anyone in life. Because as they get older, they're gonna meet tons of people, all of different um, looks and ages and demeanors, and they don't want to be afraid to tell them and communicate, this is what I want, this is what I need, because in the end, we're all in the pursuit of happiness. They want their happiness just as much as I, and teaching them speech because they need to communicate is the biggest thing in the world, not just in our field, but in any field. That's how we communicate. That's what separates us from animals. And last one is turn-taking. Again, having the child play with board games with um, their siblings, or even with us in the therapy room. You have to wait your turn, but it will come up next, because right now it's my turn, okay? And then it's your turn. And I like to pat my chest for mine and have them pat theirs for theirs, because sometimes they need that extra reinforcement, and I feel that gives them that ability to really understand. Some kids need that tactile prompting, and we like to give that to them. And just understanding that, okay, I need to be patient and not be impulsive and just mess up the game is very important because they don't need to be everywhere. We can just, you know, keep them tight, just like we all do. And then eventually they will have their turn and everything will be okay. And now we have our elementary scenario, which I'll give to Miss Alicia. So um, for this scenario, we have Ashley, an eight year old girl. Um, enrolled in elementary school and in this prompt it's talking about she's having mother reports having difficulty interacting with others diagnosed with mild ASD um, at the age of three has been receiving speech therapy in the past but still having trouble interacting with others um, she plays near people but does not interact with her peers um, and when speaking to others she will only talk about preferred topics so for her it's princesses and movies and often does not face her communication partner so some goals we might have set up for her, um, we have this first one. So when meeting new people, she will look at the person she is speaking to and will demonstrate appropriate verbalization, uh, greetings, nice to meet you, while maintaining appropriate physical um, distance and conversations in eight out of 10 opportunities. So um, when we're looking at intervention methods for this uh, goal, we can really use a variety of the ones that we've had, we talked about earlier. One is direct instruction is always good to just go over what does a greeting look like? Um, what are different types of greetings? And let's practice those. Um, we can use role playing. So we can do a social scenario of meeting new friends. Um, what are some things that we might um, say when we're meeting new people? Um, and then we can also use uh, video modeling. So like the videos we saw earlier from Everyday Speech, they have a whole library of different videos on different topics. Um, and we can talk about what it's like to um, 
greet someone appropriately, and we can talk about what we should do and maybe what we shouldn't do. Um, and then also that physical distance, so understanding personal space. That's something we can practice role playing in the clinic, at home you can do as well. Um, those are all uh, ways we can target this goal. The next one, this one's really good. Uh, maintain uh, a non-preferred topic of conversation with the clinician for at least three exchanges. So a lot of the times we do have kiddos that only like specific things. I know I have quite a, I have a little girl. She loves just princess, anything girly she loves to talk about. But when I try to ask her anything about her day or vacation, I just get, she's just looking around, she won't respond to me. So um, I'm trying to show her with, I use like a visual, a flow map for her, and I have pictures of her and pictures of myself. And I kind of show her um, the turn taking aspect of it. So I'm going to ask her something about vacation and then it becomes her turn to respond. So I'm giving her that visual and I give her possible answers that she might be able to say back, especially if it's a non-preferred topic. Sometimes they might just not know what to say if it's something they're not familiar with. So giving her some general questions that she could ask in any environment, like, can you tell me more about that? Oh, that sounds interesting. What is that about? So kind of giving her a general idea of what she can ask that can apply to multiple situations, um, especially about a topic that she's not preferring or something that she doesn't know too much about. Um, and at home, you can do it too. Like any game that involves turn taking, like if you have Jenga, you know, come up with a topic beforehand, say it's summer, and you and your child can take turns before you get to pick a Jenga piece, ask me a question or I have to ask you a question about your day or vacation or whatever or whatever the topic is, and then you can take turns that way. So um, we also, for that one, you can do video modeling again. There's videos on that. Uh, role playing in therapy is good. Um, practicing, doing scripted, non-scripted. Um, and then also you could even use a social story for that one, talking about um, what do we do when there's a topic that we don't know very much about? How does it make us feel? Does it make us feel uncomfortable? Or can we start to build some confidence and be able to work through this conversation? And then we can transition to a topic that I like. So you can, you can use a variety of those methods as well for that one. Um, and then lastly, maintaining appropriate involvement in group activities. So um, where we're talking about eye gaze, maintaining appropriate body orientation, greeting, and referring to other group members. This goal I think would best be targeted in a social skills group, especially with a clinician that's present. Um, we might have an activity that involves um, an art activity. So it involves cutting and colors, and we purposely will only place one pair of scissors for four kiddos and a few different colors. So they're, all those goals are being implicitly targeted amongst all the kiddos. They're having to ask each other to borrow the scissors. They're having to ask um, for a specific color, referring to each other by name, um, and having to turn their body to the person that they need it from. And by having the clinician there to kind of guide them, like, oh, you know what, I don't think so-and-so heard you, try saying their name a little bit louder or try asking again, maybe they weren't paying attention. So being there to provide that immediate feedback is great reinforcement for them so that they're able to see, oh, okay, that was good, or darn, that didn't work, like, let me try something else. So um, social skills groups are amazing for that and um, they offer them at, our facility has them, many therapy facilities have them. Um, and if you wanna try something uh, in your own life, you could do, um, group classes like swimming classes, soccer, and talk to your kiddo, use a social story beforehand. How am I going to get through this activity? What might I say? Um, and then you can talk about it afterwards as well. You can go through um, what went good, what could they try better the next time. So um, that's a way we could target this goal. Uh, I think that's how I would handle it. Next we're gonna do a middle school, high school scenario. Oh, question. I think it's a really great question. His question was regarding when the child has no desire. Um, I think then it comes down to an understanding. Do they understand what it's for? Um, I was working with not a child on the spectrum, but a, just a, an individual who um, didn't understand what it was, why he needed to play soccer. Why do I need to do this? I, I don't, why do I have to have this friend? I don't get it. And it was a matter of going through and teaching them 
what we were able to learn about this friend and learning about what do we get. It's the same thing with um, uh, following someone's eye gaze. Why do I do eye gaze? Why is this important to me? Well, it comes down to teaching the skill to the child that this is what our friend is going to give us. Our friend gives us the friendship, and they have to be able to feel the friendship and understand that friendship. And then it comes to finding that common ground between him and the friend, whether it's a video game. Well, if they're not, how are you going to know if this person likes this video game? And it's the, the teaching of, you know, you need to know what your friend likes so then you're able to engage in that conversation with them. You're able to um, invite them over to play dates. If your child doesn't want to have friends and doesn't see the need for it or doesn't, why I don't, I don't need this, I'm fine in my room, then it's harder. It definitely is harder, but you still have to teach the why. Why is this important? Why do we have to do this? What happens if we have to borrow a pencil at school? Who are you going to ask? You have to be able to ask your friend. If you don't have a friend, what are you going to do? Um, little things like that. I think that's where when you're in the moment, that's when it really becomes important. Um, and finding a good group to coordinate with and to build that friendship within there to where they understand. You're going to need to, um, Michelle Garcia Winner has a fantastic book. Uh, thinking about you, thinking about me, and it starts to get into social perspective taking, and it gets into why it is so important. But she always emphasizes in um, in social skills the why. This is why I need to make a friend. This is why I have to look at somebody. This is why when I have a conversation with my dad, I'm not going to talk to him like this. I'm going to talk to him like this. This is why I need to do this. And um, you want to be able to convey that message at that child's level whether they're little and you say I need you to look at me because I lets me know that you're thinking about me and they start to understand that message and then they take that and they carry that through um, as they get older um, but it's it's all about the why 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 is this going to help me because right now they don't it's not that they don't care they don't see the why they don't see why it's important they don't see what it's going to do for them down the road but if they have, if they're going out on the playground and they're playing with their friends, or they want, or they're in the, um, if they're in a, a structured game, they might not have the innate need to play with those friends, but they have to participate at that point in time. This is why you have to participate. This is why you have to play this game in PE. You know, this is why you have to do this. So there is still that why. Or even to just being around others, like if they want to go on a play or they want their turn or something, but it's not their turn yet. Socially, we can't just like move everybody out of the way and then they get their turn first. They have to start to understand that there is a, a way that we have to so be around other people socially. We kind of teach that. It's difficult sometimes, but having them understand, oh, I can't cut in front of the whole line, I have to wait for my turn. So then we start to explain the why in that aspect as well. And it's not so much the why as in, this is why you have to have a friend. Because that's what, right now he doesn't understand, I don't need to have a friend. Right now it's why you need to follow the rules to be a part of society. Okay? You're so welcome. Yeah. Um, most schools, she wanted to know about the percentage of accuracy. Most social skills goals should be written um, either across sessions or in so many trials. If you have a goal that's ever written, you know, 80% accuracy in three out of four trials. If you do the math, that's not 80% accuracy because I'm asking you to be 80% accurate 80% of the time. And I fight with school districts about this all the time. And then I have to like draw pictures and, and stuff and then I get asked not to come back. Um, <laughs> um, so hopefully, like you see the first one, it says 8 out of 10 opportunities. So was it successful or was it not? That's kind of what we're looking for. What was the level of success? Were they able to take the skills, maybe that conversational exchange only got halfway through. Maybe they needed some modeling and they needed some help. So it does come down to the clinician and what they're basing it off of, and hopefully they write those clear definitions down for you. Um, they should be able to get through this task 
you know, with two to three, you know, prompts with 80% accuracy to where I don't have to go in there and go, no, no, you don't ask that question yet. You have to ask this question or what more do you need to say? So if I start going over my level of prompting, they're not reaching that accuracy that I want. And if I just have to help them maybe one time, two times, well, that's fantastic. And they did that. Okay, but um, for a lot of our goals, we're looking at trials or we're looking at opportunities. It's hard to invent an opportunity for them to do some stuff. So sometimes when I see goals where it says 80% accuracy and I'm like, well, I got to go make this happen so I can get them at 80%. If you can get them in um, four out of five trials, then you know that that's a real nice situation that they were able to be a part of and it maybe wasn't very novel. So that, those are good opportunities right there. Um, hopefully they're not writing, you know, percentage and trials at the same time. Yes? <laughs> yeah, that's not the right math. <laughs> it's not good. It doesn't. <laughs> no, and you can't, if you do the math, it's not the right math because you can't be 80% accurate 80% of the time. That's basically what you're asking. Yeah, so you either have to be 80% accurate over three sessions, 80% accurate out of five out of five trials, or you have to be accurate, will accurately do this, or will be able to do this in four out of five trials, because four out of five is still 80%. Okay? Good questions. Go ahead. Uh, so now we have an example of an older student. This is Jack, who's an eighth grader. He's having difficulty knowing when it's okay to ask a question. Um, he likes to just interrupt whenever he thinks he has something to say or he has something he wants to know. And uh, he's having difficulty participating in group work. Uh, I've noticed this issue a lot with some of our older kids that we've worked with where they have a strong opinion and don't know how to navigate the dynamic within group work. And that's something that's really focused on a lot as they start getting older. Um, and a lot of that comes from prep for going into college, the workforce, and other settings where they're going to be interacting with people frequently. But for this particular student, he will judge other people's opinions and shout, you're wrong, and then try to leave. Um, and as he's doing that, he is even having difficulty with his friend group, where he's just not providing enough relevant information or provides completely irrelevant information that leaves everyone confused. So if we're looking at this case, we can see he's got difficulty understanding people's perspectives, difficulty providing important information during conversation. He has difficulty regulating his own impulses and knowing when it's okay to do something and when it's not, and just understanding expected and unexpected ways to interact in a classroom. So I've listed out a bunch of different goals here that could be appropriate for this student. Um, and starting with the first one, it's talking about group work. And here we see that percentage again, 80% accuracy, but this is based off of teacher report. So when we're giving a percentage like 80% accuracy, we're giving some wiggle room in terms of he's able to make a few mistakes, but we hope that he achieves a level of mastery with this skill. Um, for this, okay. I know you guys want to get some of the resources, you know, we're getting short on time. Okay. So I want to. Just do like one. Yeah, go a couple. A couple of these, yeah, I can we'll do that. Right to resources. Sounds good. Um, so, just finishing up this goal, we're, when we're thinking about group work, it's going to be really important for us to collaborate with a teacher in particular because they're going to be the ones that see him in this setting and that can help support him. Some of the things that I would do if I was working with this client is I would provide a visual schedule or some kind of social story that he can have in his binder accessible to him at all times to remind him of how he can appropriately interact in a group. And I would definitely want to do a lot of video modeling and role playing within the speech room so that he knows how he can act in that setting. Something that you could do at home with your child if they're having difficulty with this would be to set up a mock group project. You can actually do science experiments or cooking or anything with a child like this with a family and that's group work. So you can work on everyone sharing uh, materials, everyone collaborating and being cognizant of how other people feel as a result of what we're doing. And a great thing to do is sabotage. Purposely leave something there or make it wrong and see how they react. What could we do? How are we going to problem solve this type of a situation? 
sabotage is a great tool in everything that you're doing. Okay, I will. <laughs> I, I do it all the so, time. <laughs> <laughs> so the last thing that I'm going to touch on just for his uh, brief goal would be to do expected and unexpected behaviors. And this is going to transition into the resources that we're mentioning. Because if you're seeing this on your child's IEP, you may not know what expected and unexpected behaviors are exactly. That's actually referencing something from Michelle Garcia Winner. Here, she talks about, yes, <laughs> she talks about what you should do in a certain situation as being expected and what you shouldn't do in a situation as being unexpected. Um, this can be in any setting for this client, but what we notice is he's given a very specific support in this goal. He's got a social behavior map visual. Social behavior maps are great because they have cause, effect, and feelings tied into it. So this can be a piece of paper that's drawn out by a speech therapist or by you at home saying what's happening, what's going to happen as a result of it, and how is that going to make people feel. It's really good at those higher level cognitive skills, looking at how we can understand what we're doing and why it's impacting people the way that we think. Um, I had a client that I worked with that I used a social behavior map for because he was falling asleep in class. and he thought it was perfectly fine. I'm tired and I think this is a good time to take a nap. So <laughs> we, we had the, the cause is that you're tired and you're getting exhausted in class, you fall asleep. Then the effect is the teacher comes up to you and gets mad and you are becoming frustrated as, as a result. But how is the teacher feeling? The teacher's feeling upset too because you're falling asleep in class when you shouldn't be. Um, and so we, we broke down everything and Michelle Garcia Winner was a great resource for that student in particular because it really made things more concrete. Now that's a great why for you guys. Using those social behavior maps, this is what's happening, this is how it makes me feel, but this is how it makes me feel. And I don't think you want me to feel this way. And this is how I think about you when I feel like this. That's key. So looking at our preschool kiddos and all of our resources, great stuff there. Um, you know, mommy and me classes are great, but really, it's really about your interaction and being within the moment and what you do during that time and how you're going to help facilitate them, whether you're going to script it, you're going to do a social story, you're going to do the nice map, you're going to map out their behavior. If you act like this at the grocery store, this is how you feel at the grocery store, but this is how I feel at the grocery store. This is what's going to happen, and how are you going to feel if that happens? Okay. Um, we start getting into elementary, we start getting into Michelle Garcia Winter. Please look on her website, uh, socialthinking.com. Lots of great stuff on there. She has wonderful parent training. She goes around the world, uh, so she's everywhere, and she is the guru of all social skills. Um, Superflex is a great way to bring in some comic book characters. You're looking at... Um, those types of characters that kids can relate with. Well, maybe I have a rock brain right now. I'm stuck on something. I'm too, like, this is what I say. This is what it's going to be. So I have this rock brain. I ended up um, copying the Superflex character, <coughs> putting him in little circle things. Where I would walk around with them, and I would flip one over on a kid's desk. And he would know at that point in time, this is who he was. And he'd, like, make the association because it was a comic book superhero, and he'd be like, oh, Oh, I'm being like this. i got to stop that. So Superflex goes around, and he starts to like save the world by um, using his good social skills. And uh, another resource that's very similar is Julia Cook. The book pictured here is actually one of hers. She has a bunch of social stories that are drawn out for students, and they're really cute and fun. And you can get that book easily on Amazon. They have tons of different options. But My Mouth is a Volcano is one that's used for people that like to just interrupt because they can't quite hold back what they're trying to say. Um, it's a really great visually, and I love how they use the terminology to help make it really clear what's happening. Um, with middle school and high school, we've got a lot of other resources as well. Everyday Speech is one that I use pretty regularly. They have worksheets, uh, social skills videos, they have games, they have a wonderful social skills Jeopardy, and a lot of their materials free. Um, they have everything from categorizing material to actual scripted examples of conversation on there. Uh, and then another one that would be really helpful is 
virtual speech VR courses. It's an application that is available on the App Store. I believe it's free to download, but then there are in-app purchases. And what's great about it is if you have a child that's getting ready to go into the workforce, these are mock interviews. They actually can gauge joint attention, like if you're looking at the person that's interviewing you long enough and will measure the time frame. They can change the setting to be a panel interview versus one-on-one -on -one interview, and they give you questions too. So you can practice appropriate responses. Um, and then the last one, just to touch on really briefly, Teachers Pay Teachers always has wonderful material that you can download. They have tons of free stuff and some paid material as well. One of my favorites is SpeechTube. They take viral YouTube videos and then provide a bunch of worksheets for you to use. They have some on verbal communication, nonverbal, body language, and social skills, and then they have worksheets that will look at things that you think versus things that you say. If your child's having difficulty with language as well, they have ways of retelling what happened in the video. But it's really engaging, and the kids have a lot of fun with it. So these are just some of the studies that we reference throughout if you're interested at looking at any of the research behind all of this. But at this time, we're gonna open up the floor to address any other questions. Nice. So she has visual schedules if you guys would like to grab one. Uh, any other questions? Thank you guys so much for having us here. Oh, yes. I'm going to tell you the speech therapist. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm going to tell you that you're going to have to ask some questions. If it's a psychologist, you're going to say, what is your background in this? What is, you know, you want to know what training they've had. Any, even if you ask a speech therapist, you're going to want to know. Speech therapists will dive a little bit more into the language component of it. Um, yeah, so I think they're able to give you a little bit more. But I would always ask whomever you're working with, what experience do you have in this? And you want to know. Um, what's happening. I, I, people always want to come to me, but I tell them they shouldn't come to me. They should come to these guys. The guys that are, the ones that are fresh out of college and the ones that, because they're so alive and so vivacious that I'm just like, you don't want me. You want these guys because these guys have something to prove and they're just, they're awesome. But, um, so don't take that into account, but look at their knowledge. Look at their level of knowledge. Look at what they can bring to you, what information um, that they have for you. Yeah, definitely. Any other questions? Thank you guys.